these workshops uh, originally started off as a one day meeting um, for the Royal Society of Chemistry Open Chemical Sciences uh, uh, meeting. Uh, unfortunately, uh, COVID meant that that became a virtual meeting and it morphed into a five day uh, event with uh, sessions on open data and, uh, and, and open publishing. But the workshops on the open uh, science tools for uh, chemists were really popular. And so we decided that we would uh, continue those. And we've been holding them one a month for all of this year. Uh, today, we have uh, uh, a group who uh, spoke at that original one day meeting, uh, the, the, the guys from Fragalysis. This is a fantastic uh, free resource for uh, um, crystallography of biological mo uh, molecules. Um, as, as normal, we will have a break after about one hour and uh, let people get up and have a little walk around. Uh, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A box. Uh, we'll keep monitoring it. And if there's any questions, we'll pass them on to the uh, presenter. Um, Today's first speaker is uh, Darren, and uh, I'd like to hand over to him and uh, ask him to uh, start off this session. Sure. If you just give me a second to share my screen. Can you see my slides in proper presentation mode? It is, yes, all fine. Cool. Excellent. Yeah, so today we're just going to talk to you a little bit about um, some of the resources we have at the XChem platform at Diamond, which uh, revolve around fragment screening and, and follow-up with fragments. Um, so my name is Dad and I'm the Senior XChem Beamline Scientist at Diamond Light Source. And just as a, a way of introduction, um, some of you might be aware of Diamond, some of you might have been in the past, um, but we're the UK's National Synchrotron and we're based on the Harwell Research Campus just south of Oxford. So the synchrotron works like a giant microscope by accelerating electrons to near light speed so that they give off intense light 10 billion times brighter than the sun. These intense beams of light are then directed into the laboratories known as beamlines, where scientists like me use the light to study a vast range of subject matter. Here at Diamond, we have seven macromolecular beamlines alongside dedicated facilities for cryo-electron microscopy, X-ray flea electron lasers, and last but not least, the XChem fragment screening platform which is associated with the high throughput, highly automated beamline, IO41. <clears throat> we have a large user community made up of researchers from pharmaceutical companies and academia who are making increasing use of macromolecular crystallography to identify starting points for drug discovery projects. And just to explain why that is, I'm going to brief, uh, give a brief introduction to FBDD and our platform. So typically for drug discovery projects, uh, HCS was the, the traditional method for identifying leads. And this was done by screening large libraries of typically greater than 100,000 compounds. And these are lead-like molecules with molecular weights larger than 300 Daltons. As the affinities tend to be in the micromolecular animal range, usually they would use biochemical or cellular assays to identify these hits. However, they can be difficult to optimize, and some more challenging targets have very low hit rates using HDS. So in comparison, fragment-based drug discovery or fragment screening uses libraries which are considerably smaller of compounds which are usually 250 to 300 Daltons or less. And this is a reduction in molecular complexity. There's uh, fewer molecules you can make with the smaller number of atoms available. We can screen a smaller number of compounds and still sample a large area of chemical space. However, as fragments tend to be quite weak but efficient binders, we need more sensitive methods for identifying the fragment hits. So this is typically done using um, biophysical methods. And most often, uh, iterative optimization is driven using structural biology techniques, most commonly X-ray crystallography. So as I mentioned, the most common methods for identifying fragments are biophysical techniques, uh, NMR and SBR being two very well-validated systems, as they tend to be medium to high throughput and have good sensitivity. Previously, X-ray crystallography wasn't considered a high throughput method for identifying fragment hits, but thanks to developments, both the synchron synchrotron technology and sample preparation, this has now become much more accessible, uh, largely thanks to the XChem screening platform. 
the key advantages of X-ray crystallography is it's uh, even more sensitive methods uh, compared to NMR and SVR. But also it gives you this structural information directly. So you know how you can go about optimizing these fragments into more potent lead-like molecules. I'm not going to go into detail about the XChem platform itself. I don't think that's the remit of this uh, webinar. Um, but just to give you a kind of um, overview of the platform, it's divided up into three separate parts. And it's enabled by various different unique technologies, which each in their own aren't necessarily revolutionary, but combined to deliver a really highly efficient platform. So we have uh, various different techniques that we've employed to increase the output of crystal sample preparation. So we can prepare uh, thousands of fragment salt crystals. We have a very highly automated and efficient beamline, which can do complete automated data collection. Um, for a thousand crystals, we take pretty much 48 hours. And then we've developed novel algorithms and software packages to help us with identification and data dissemination. And all of this information is recorded in one central database. So it lets any of the users in the platform focus on one step of the experiment at a time um, without worrying about recording and tracking data. So just to give you a kind of flavor of how revolutionary this platform is, um, in order to screen 1,000 crystals, so 1,000 fragments, this takes typically around one week of time in XCAM. In comparison, if you were doing this using traditional crystal soaking techniques, a lot more manual handling, this would take around about three months. And also, it's a lot easier to um, mess up your data uh, tracking when doing these kind of processes manually. There's a lot more human error involved. Obviously, once you have your hits, uh, they can be developed into more potent compounds and the, the three obvious ways for developing fragments are growing, linking, and merging. And I think Rachel's going to talk a little bit more about some software and, and tools that we have for doing that later on. So the first part of the presentation I kind of want to cover is how to assess uh, not just the fragment structure, but any sort of ligand structure that you're going to be using for uh, further analysis. So I'm just going to talk from a, a kind of crystallographer's perspective about our aims when we're doing ligand fitting into a crystal structure. So also the key aim is to model the small molecule, which is bound to your protein of interest. But you want to ensure there's good correlation with the experimental data. Most often you'll be talking about electron density or cryo-M maps. Ensure that you have realistic ligand restraints. So your small molecule has sensible bond angles, bond lengths, good planarity where required and ensure that the molecular interactions with the protein and surrounding solvents of the water molecules actually make sense. And this is an iterative process. Um, we build, we refine the model, we validate it, correct the model, refine, validate again. So for the ligand fitting process, obviously the first thing we need to do is identify ligand density, or density we believe corresponds to the ligands. We then need to generate the ligand restraints. We need to fit the ligand into this density itself. Then we need to optimize the deconfirmation and uh, refine the model, validate a model, and then it's suitable for further analysis and visualization. And there are several assumptions we make uh, when we have this data and we're trying to fit a ligand. Uh, the first one being that the data is of sufficient quality to model the ligand. For fragment screening, we suggest that the resolution of the data is 2.5 angstroms or better. As you can see in this diagram on the right-hand side, uh, moving from around about 3.5 angstrom resolution to 1.5 angstrom resolution, you can really see a distinct change in the, the kind of um, clarity of the density you're trying to model into. And this becomes even more important when working with fragments where the binding tends to be weaker and the density can, can be weaker to correspond to that. We also assume that there's a good starting model available for the proteins. This can come from a, the PDB or from a previous project. And we also assume that the ligand that we're trying to model is known. So we have some sort of description of the model, be that a smile string, a 2D structure, or we know it's a natural substrate, the KTP, and we can find this um, in a common dictionary. And this might sound like an obvious one, um, not necessarily always the case. We're actually confident that the ligand is bound. 
and there, there are some examples in the PGB where this, uh, this question has been raised. So in order to identify ligand density, uh, we use a software package called Dimple. And this is quite a straightforward uh, software package. It just runs a molecular replacement. Uh, it takes a, a model from our protein, it takes our experimental data, and it just provides these different maps. So this is a, an example that has come straight off the beamline at Diamond. And you can see this green density here corresponds to ligand bindings. So it's a really kind of fast way for us to check if there's density that isn't modeled uh, with the model we put in at the start. For fragment screening, we also have a, a novel algorithm we use to determine weak binders. This is called PANDA, or PAN data set, uh, dense, sorry, PAN density data set analysis. And what PANDA does is makes use of the large number of APO or unligonded uh, crystal structure data sets that we obtain as part of a fragment screen. So we're typically getting around uh, somewhere between 500 and 1,000 data sets, most of which, about 90%, won't contain any ligands. So we use this to generate an average map of an unlikely model, and we subtract this average map from each data set to see if there's any kind of weak binding. So if you imagine your crystal lattice and the cats or the, the molecules, the, the protein, which have a ligand bound, and the dogs are the unlikely molecules, you end up with this kind of blurred picture. And if you subtract the dog, which is the background, you end up with a much clearer picture of the cat, or in this example, the stars and the blob. So this lets us determine or identify fragments which are binding quite weak and with low occurrence. So once we've identified where we're trying to model the ligand, we need to generate the restraints from the ligand. Uh, due to the restrictions and resolution of protein crystal structures, uh, macular molecular crystallography, um, the experimental data alone isn't sufficient to actually define the 3D structure. So we need to provide some sort of restraints for the protein model, but also for the ligand. And these refinement packages take advantage of both the geometric data that we have from the, the ligand restraints and the experimental data. For small molecules, a lig ligand description is used to generate a, a dictionary for the models. And you can see an example of these files here. So it's just a kind of a descriptor of the atom type and the um, positions relative to each other. And we also provide um, standard deviations and ideal values for the different bond lengths and angles. So effectively a list of the, the low standard confirmations, which would be sensible for most ligands. So in order to generate your dictionary for novel ligands, we need to start with a, a ligand description. As I mentioned earlier, this is often a, a 2D structure or a smile string. We then extract extractor assign the atom types and then the connectivity for this molecule. And then we, we generate these tables of bond lengths, angles, ideal planes, dihedrals, and chiral centers. And, and these come from various different databases depending on what software package you're using. We generate and optimize the coordinates. And then these are output uh, ready for you to use in your actual ligand modeling experiment. So for ligand fitting, it, it just involves selection of the correct ligand confirmation. So obviously, uh, larger molecules that can adopt various different confirmations. We need to ensure we're working with the correct confirmation to start with. And then just position and orientating that in the density. Uh, so yeah, selecting the right confirmation to make sure you're not trying to force a square peg into a round hole. So the files we use for this are the, the protein models. So that's the PDB file, which has been output by Dimple typically. The reflection data, so that's the, the maps, the MTZ files that come directly off the beamline. And then the ligand coordinates, um, which is the, the, the arrangement of the small molecule and the restraints uh, in a SIF format, which were generated by the, the process that I just talked about. And then we can either manually fit this to the density using a software package called Coop, or we can use automated pipelines uh, such as RollFit from Global Phasing, which can introduce some automation to this process. So once you've uh, placed your ligand and, and carried out some cycles of refinement, it's super important that we then do some model validation. The reasons for this uh, are quite evident. In the PDB, there is over 70% of the structures contain some sort of ligand. So this is over 100,000 structures in total. 
And the quality of the small molecules modeled in these structures tends to vary to quite uh, a large extent. Um, so you can see here, uh, over the last kind of 10, 20 years, the quality has improved. So the number of or the percentage of the molecules which have been strained has come down a little bit, and the percentage which are okay are going up. But even still, we have quite a large amount, 20%, where the small molecule models might be uh, questionable. And there's an example here just from the PDB where you can see this aminopyrimidine ring system, which you would expect to be pretty planar, uh, has some pretty unusual geometry around here and, and over here as well. And the problem is that the overall statistics of the crystal crystallographic model don't necessarily reflect um, quality of the ligand which is bound. So this is only a small portion of that model. So it's really important to consider that crystal structures are models and they can slash almost always will contain some sort of errors. So when we're validating the model, there's a few things we need to consider. <clears throat> the first one is simply the quality of the fit to the experimental data. So there's a statistic that we use called real space correlation coefficient or RSCC. And this is a measure of the fit of the residues and the ligand to electron density. Fortunately for the end users uh, making use of crystal structures available in the PDB, this statistic is available in the PDB validation report, but we also provide it in XCHEM Explorer and XCHEM Review, and we'll come back and touch on this a little bit. Um, so this is just an example of one of the entries from the PDB, and you can see amongst the statistics, you get this RSCC value, and this example is 0 0.96. And this value varies between one, which is a perfect correlation, and minus one, which is a perfect anti-correlation, Generally, anything above 0 0.95 is considered a really excellent fit. Anything above 0.8, uh, 2.95 is, is quite reasonable. Anything below 0.8 is considered a bit questionable. And um, the last measure I've seen, 11.3% of PDB ligands actually fall into this category. And just to follow up on that, um, so, I touched on resolution being quite important for modeling the ligand earlier, but when you're in this kind of reasonable resolution range, the real space correlation coefficient isn't that dependent on resolution. So you, the distribution in these uh, charts going down the resolution and improving in resolution tend to be fairly similar, although there's a little bit more questionable data with lower resolution. Ends. The next thing to validate is ligand geometry itself. You can use quantum mechanical methods for this. Uh, they do tend to be very CPU intensive. And as I mentioned earlier, the lowest energy confirmation isn't always representative of what's bound to your protein. These uh, calculations tend to be carried out in vacuum rather than actually bound to a protein. <clears throat> so the more common method is by comparison with different databases. This is particularly useful when you're using a common ligand such as a nucleotide, amino acids, things like ATP, uh, largely because there's a lot of entries in these databases for molecules like that. It's slightly less useful for novel ligands because there's fewer examples, um, but what a lot of the software packages do is fragment the molecules into things that it does recognize, uh, various different functional groups, ring systems, etc. But it's important to confirm the quality of the database entry first. Uh, so for very few examples of things even remotely similar to what you're looking at, then you know to just be a little bit more cautious. So one of the uh, examples of a software package that we use quite often to validate ligand geometry is called Mogul. This comes from CCDC. And this compares the geometries against the, the Cambridge crystallographic database. And this is a particularly powerful cross-validation if your restraints are used are generated using programs which don't use this database. So you've kind of got that cross-validation between different sources of information. Mogul um, can be used as part of Qt, and you can get this nice graphical representation where uh, the green circles show very nice, happy bond lengths and angles, yellow being slightly less happy, um, and then red being particularly unhappy. It also provides a, a Z-score, which is included again as part of the PDB validation report. So you can download that from the PDB and the PDB flag anything with a Z score of above two as an outlier. 
or in some cases values up to five can be acceptable. And the next thing to check before really using the model for anything um, further down the pipeline is to check that the interactions and clashes actually make sense. So is the small molecule interacting with the protein in a sensible manner? You can use different software packages such as MoProvity, which uh, runs these two programs for this and probe uh, for hydro adding the hydrogen atoms and just looking for different clashes. There are clashes of the protein, so you can see <clears throat> these small dots indicate some sort of clash. Pretty minor in this example for a well model ligand. Uh, but you can also generate these 2D ligand plots. Um, there's various different software packages you can use this uh, use to do this, but it gives you a kind of sense of the ligand environment and if the surrounding uh, residues and solvent actually makes sense with the, the parts of the ligand you're interacting with. Next up, we have disorder and mobility. So there's a statistic called B factor or atomic displacement parameter, which is a statistical measure of um, the uncertainty in positions of atoms. Again, this is provided in the PDB. So for every single atom in the PDB, we'll have a value for this. Also, the average for each molecule is presented in the validation report. So when comparing the, the average for your ligand, the B factor is much, much larger than the surrounding protein residues. This suggests that the ligand is unlikely to be present where it's modeled or the occupancy for that ligand is higher than it should be. If the atomic B factor for part of the ligand is much higher than the rest of the molecule, and that suggests that this part of the molecule is disordered. So if you're particularly interested in interactions or building off that part of the molecule, you might want to proceed with caution. Uh, the other addendum is that several approaches are often taken by crystallographers for dealing with these partially ordered ligands. Some crystallographers may just delete the um, atoms with high B factors. Some will set the occupancy, occupancy to zero just for those atoms. And some will leave it with the same occupancy as the rest of the ligand, but just let those B factors rise. So in terms of uh, sources of errors, so there's various different things, commonly encountered problems um, that appear in different crystal structures. And this is largely down to the fact that map interpretation is subjective and unambiguous ligand placement can be challenging. Some of the reasons for this might be just pure quality or low resolution data or density being incomplete for part of the ligand. You might have poor ligand restraints or weights to start with. Um, so you're never going to get into a good, happy geometry if you're starting off with poor, a poor library in the beginning. You might have highly flexible ligands, which are pointing into a very solvent exposed part of the molecule. Uh, so they may be rotating or spinning around, so you're not going to get clear density for those. Likewise, if you have multiple ligand conformations, you're going to have um, multiple low occupancy populations to build. And sometimes people are just trying to build the wrong ligand or have a poor understanding of the chemistry. Maybe the, the ligand has reacted with the protein in some way, and you just need to be aware that you're trying to model the right thing. So just to finish off, I'm going to touch on some online validation tools that you can make use of. So we kind of talked about the PDB and the validation reports a few times. So just an example where you can find this. Uh, so for this crystal structure that we deposited of the SARS-CoV-2 macro domain, under display files, you'll be able to find this validation tool PDF. And this will give you a large document, which is provided to the crystal log for when they deposit the structure and used as a validation tool themselves. In this document, you'll find this nice graphical representation of the mobile report. So you can see in the, this, we, this structure, we have two different copies of the ligand. And this is, again, color coded based on the quality of the bond lengths, bond angles, uh, torsions, and rings. So you can see this pink uh, torsion angle is not particularly happy, but overall, these molecules are quite happy. And this is reflected in the Z scores. So the number of bond lengths with a Z score greater than two, zero, uh, similar bond angles. The report also gives you the 
average B factors and the RSCC values. So we can see that the one of the ligands at 501 is very happy with very reasonable B factors. And there's actually an issue with this second ligand where the RSC value is quite low and the B factors are quite high. So this has been modeled with the, the wrong occupancy actually. A relatively new tool that the PDB has added is this kind of ligand quality metric or tab. And this shows you the examples of that ligand, which is modeled both in, in the structure you're looking at, but also other examples of that same ligand in the PDB in general. So you can see for this example, we've got a reasonably, uh, a very good geometry and a, a reasonable fit to the density. And in the PDB in general, several examples of this molecule, which are actually worse off than this fit. So if you're looking at maybe this structure here, you might want to compare to this data set to see if there's a better geometry for that molecule, which would fit the density. The PDBE or the Protein Dead Bank in Europe also provides these environment details. So this is similar to that uh, leg plot or flev I mentioned earlier, where you can just have a, a quick look at the surrounding residues of the protein and just check for sensible interactions going on. So these kind of high pi stacking and interactions with this urea group. More probity, uh, again, we touched on this earlier. This is mainly used to identify clashes or poor geometry, not just in the ligand, but the overall protein model. Uh, but one useful thing it, it does is identify side chain flips uh, so for these the residues. So if you run it through mole probity and you see that one of the residues, which is quite close to your ligand of interest, uh, if there's good evidence for a flip, you may want to rotate that side chain and improve the interaction with your ligands. And finally, we have the, the PDB reader data bank. So this uh, contains optimized versions of existing PDB entries. You can also load PDB entries into it if you have a structure which has not been deposited yet. And this will try and improve the fit to electron density maps. You get this nice chart here where it shows you the change in fit. So the change in RSCC values for each residue and makes slight improvements. It also gives you this information about what side chains and rotomers uh, and things that flipped, waters that removed, etc. So quite often it's worthwhile actually working with the model coming out of PDB reader rather than the initial model from the PDB. So just to summarize, um, ligand binding is rarely complete, particularly with fragments, because they tend to be weak but efficient binders. So they tend to be at low occupancy. And it's important to validate any structure you're going to use for follow-up follow -up work. So crystallography is subjective. It's down to be the crystallographer's um, interpretation of electron density maps, their knowledge of the chemistry, and, and level of experience as well. It's important to remember that crystallographers are making models. Uh, and the, I think this quote is, is largely about statistics, but it's definitely applicable here. Uh, but one thing crystallographers are always thinking about is how we can improve our models for use by end users. And it's important as users, you don't make assumptions about the models when working with them. So either speak to the crystallographer, if it's someone in a project you're working with, or, or carry out your own validation to make sure you're working with the, the best quality model you can be. And one thing that Rachel and Tyler are going to talk a little bit more about is how we can better communicate this information about these models as crystallographers. So just to finish off before I hand over to Tyler, I'm just going to share community uh, acute window. Yeah. Yes, we can. Yes, I'm just going to show you how we incorporate some of these two, uh, statistics and validation tools into the X10 platform and our, our refinement processes. So this is uh, just a, an example of one of the models we've been building for the SARS-CoV-2 main protease. Um, you see the, the ligand is modeled fairly nicely into that density with a little bit of weak density around this ring here. But during the refinement process, our software packages make all these statistics we've talked about available to the, the user. So you can see the average B factor of your ligand, how that B factor compares to the surrounding protein. I, value of one would be ideal here. The real space correlation coefficient, which for a fragment uh, 0.8 is actually pretty good. And some various other statistics about the general uh, 
quality of the crystal as well. And then likewise, during the refinement process, we have these reports which we make available. So the ligand CC is the same as the real space correlation coefficient. So you have that information for every ligand in a table format. But we also have these uh, cluster reports which contain the information from mobiles. So again, there's geometry validation um, with your RSCC values and other quality indicators of the, the geometry of the ligand itself. So this information is available to anyone working on our platform from the, the first steps all the way through to deposition of our structures. So I'm going to pass over to Tyler now, who's going to tell you a little bit about how we validate the models that we're producing from our XCAM pipeline. Before that, Darren, I think there's one question that's come through if you want to answer it. Um, let me just grab it. It's in the chat. So the question is, in addition to standard deviation of bond lengths and valence angles, can you characterize standard deviation from restraints in terms of RMSD? I Sorry. think. Can you repeat the question? So I'll just try to find it. Right yeah, it's in the second from the bottom of the chat. In addition to STD, I guess it's standard deviation. Uh, yeah, so we, we have weightings for the deviation from what is recommended to see the ideal uh, values. Sometimes you'll find that you do need to tweak these, uh, the value or how much you can stray from the ideal values. There's no restraint that's going to be absolutely perfect. Sometimes it does take a little bit of planning and tweaking to, to make sure you're getting a good quality uh, confirmation. Um, there's one more question that's come through as well. Uh, how can we come to know Z scores or outliers for the ligand and protein? So you can access these values in the, the PDB validation report um, or using software like Mogul uh, from CCDC. If it's a okay, deposit structure, you can just grab that information. Um, I'm not sure of a web tool which will generate those values. We primarily use mobile, uh, a local installation mobile. Awesome, thank you, Darren. I think that is all for questions for now. So we can hand over to Tyler. Okay, let me, uh, what am I sharing? Okay, all right. Uh, let's just, can everyone see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Lovely. Um, so hopefully I'll do a bit of a live demo uh, at some point. Um, so I'm going to talk mainly about how we sort of we validate our structures and then also how we are able to get our data or get any data really uh, into Fregalysis. And the first thing uh, that we have to do is sort of shift how we think about a crystal and think about the ligands inside the crystal instead. So uh, we can do this with the Fregalysis API, which I'll go through in more detail. But the, the idea is, is that when you have a, a shortlisted crystal model, either from your experiments or if you can take, you can take them straight from the PDB, uh, we need to basically cut out the, well, orient the view so that the ligands in this case are the uh, main focus. And then from there, we validate each individual one. So in the case of a crystal where there is a very good ligand and perhaps a marginal ligand, we're able to assess each of those independently uh, and then uh, carry on with our um, yeah, with what we want to do. Um, part of the review and annotation process is to you know, approve, reiterate, reject ligands, um, but also assign a biological context, which is important going forward for Fregalysis as well. Uh, and lastly, the validation is also to check if the conversion from crystal to ligands uh, was actually successful. Uh, so how um, we prepare the data is we run stuff through the Fregalysis API, which is a Python package. Um, and what this does is it takes a set of PDB files, 
Um, so in our case at XCAM, we basically have hundreds of um, models that we collect um, that sort of Darren or someone else uh, does all the refinement for, and then we uh, align them together so that they are all looking in the same direction or using the same reference frame. Uh, so what this would imply or in, entail is sort of, you know, all the structures may have slight variations between them. So we want to put all the active sites together. And these are aligned by the alpha carbons uh, of the main chain. Um, and also, um, yeah, of the main chain, um, but we can sort of align, you know, chains separately together if we want to. But the default behavior is just to align everything together, including the B chains to bring all the active sites together. Um, so we have input files. Um, additionally, we can include electron density maps, um, which is important for XCAM review and validation. So to be able to really critique individual ligands, uh, the map files are particularly useful being able to see the electron densities. But the, the alignment happens, and then the, the aligned PDB files then have the ligands yanked out of them, uh, and the various files required for frugalysis are generated uh, in this step. And in the output, uh, you, you'll tend to get your the input crystal and then a, a separate folder basically for every single ligand that it finds. And you'll sort of have this notation uh, where the letter on the outside uh, represents the chain where the ligand was found and the number indicates the uh, order in which the ligand was in the PDB file or in the input model. So zero would be the first ligand, one would be the second ligand. These are both in the A chain. Um, con and in this other example, you have zero A and zero B, which are the first ligands in the A and the B chain. Um, and due to the alignment process, uh, these ligands could exist in the same space um, just due to how the, um, the functionality works, but that behavior can be turned off. Um, so following that, um, you know, this, this will just give you a set of ligand structures, but not really much information. There might be some information in there that you don't want to communicate with the outside world or you think is um, not important. Uh, so then we go through uh, rounds of review and uh, annotation. Um, this was, for, for our case, this was particularly uh, important um, with MPRO where we had hundreds, uh, more close to thousands of crystals uh, that we needed to get through very quickly and then put them out on, on the internet uh, for the public to use. And we also had many people uh, that also wanted to be able to say, oh, I, I want this, this ligand to go through, but this ligand uh, or this crystal needs re-refining because I've identified some problems. Um, that was the main use for it, but then it also has uh, sort of the use of being able to use it as like a dashboard to visualize, um, to visualize an experiment very quickly, um, to track the progress of certain crystals if you're particularly important, uh, interested in them. Uh, and most importantly, uh, be able to look at the data as it would exist on Fregalysis as an external user um, before it even goes out. And recently, uh, we have added the ability to pick and critique individual atoms, which I'll demonstrate, um, which is useful in being able to communicate um, sort of aspects of the model that a crystallographer might not be important in and sort of links back to what Darren was saying earlier. So, it might be a bit cluttered, um, but this is the this is a screen grab from the internal version of XCAM review uh, that we have on Diamond. So users of XCAM do have access to this uh, in the future. Um, but what and I'll, I'll go to a live demo to show sort of how it works. But the the view of the ligand is sort of demonstrated in this top portion, um, and then you have this table with all the ligands. Uh, that you'd want and um, not shown here but towards the right of the table is uh, all the statistics that were sort of presented that Darren was alluding to which are auto-generated or important for a crystallographer to make uh, to make a decision of uh, and but we also do contextualize 
some of the important values, such as the you know the RMSD of the angles and the bonds, um, and not shown here, but also the ability to view uh, the uh, the reports, the mobile restraint reports that generated. Um, most importantly, is that after you've done the review and the annotation, uh, the the web application also provides the means to download the the reviews and the annotations in a format which you are then able to upload to Frigalysis very easily um, using an online loader that we provide. Um, we do have a lightweight version um, so that you are able to use if you don't actually have access to XCAM um, and you can run this with data that you pull from the PDB uh, and it works quite well and I'll be demonstrating that in a minute. Um, but the the uh, the hosted version that we provide for users is a bit more high powered because we have the data is prepared in such a way that you know the the, the statistics are readily available and encoded in the correct format. Um, so just to briefly touch on the annotation aspect, um, when uh, when you launch XCAM review, you're also able to view uh, what the overall experiment looks like. Uh, in this case, you know, we have we have a big portion of ligands sort of in this clump here, a smaller set here. And then we have, we have two ligands, perhaps by themselves that might be biologically interesting or uh, could be ignored. Um, but the user is expected to sort of go through each ligand individually and ascribe uh, what uh, they believe uh, is well, you know where where this ligand belongs. So let me just uh, open up my uh, here's one I made earlier. So here is a um, here's a copy of Empro with uh, a few numbers of um, crystals. And when I I'll zoom in here quickly. Um, so here I've got the view of Empro one six one, but I can quickly change. Uh, whichever ligand I want to describe, and um, you know, it, it belongs in site A, for example, uh, and you're very, you can very quickly add the labels um, relatively quickly without having to worry about uh, accidentally assigning a label to the wrong one. And it is also quite easy to you know, give it. Uh, give a different label if you uh, so desire, if there is a different biological context uh, for the ligand that you're interested in. Um, as you'll see, it does populate there. Um, just to go through the review process, um, it's slightly more uh, magical, I like to think. Um, so again, we're able to click on a row uh, and it will find all the data for us and present it much like the, the um, the view that Darren was showing earlier um, with the Coop program, uh, we're actually able to visualize the electron densities. Um, so here's the, the two, of, uh, two FOFC and the event map. Um, and then you, uh, you know, in this case, there's nothing wrong with this ligand. So we can go through and basically say, you know, I'm, I'm very confident in this ligand uh, and then I'll submit a review. And then we can just go to the another crystal or another ligand in this case. So this one here, um, I know for an example here uh, that the electron density around uh, this sort of oxygen carbon over here uh, isn't actually well explained perhaps. It might suggest that there is a uh, alternative confirmation. So as part of the review, uh, just to demonstrate the atom picking process, uh, Oh God, Ooh. Uh, we can click on an atom that we, we think are particularly worry, worrisome. Uh, and then we can say that there you know, might be a multiple confirmation. And then we can assign, uh, we can assign those particular comments to the selected atoms. So if I wanted to select another one and give it a different, a different sort of thing, uh, you know, I could write a particular example. Um, and this will be carried on 
uh, downstream into Frigalysis, which Rachel will show uh, how it would look. Um, but otherwise, you know, despite the fact that there is some problems with the ligand, uh, you know, we encourage people to basically be be upfront with the whole process and say, oh, actually, you know, the, the model's good, but you know, this atom here, or maybe there's something on the protein that doesn't make sense. Um, you know, uh, there, there is something wrong. And then we could also submit that. Uh, and then that review is also submitted. Um, just for convenience sake, the, you know, the, the, the local axiom review is able to sort of highlight individual residues if you find that the moving around between models is a bit disjointing and you can't you know, maybe lose the focus. Uh, there is sort of a way of uh, finalizing anchor points. Um, the last part, uh, so this is that the, you can copy uh, the or download the data as you need to. So you can download a zip file uh, and it says here mpro-3.zip uh, and that would be completely valid to then upload onto Frigalysis because it's gone through, uh, it will create the correct files as we need to. Um, so just to go back to here. Um, so I, I did a lot, I did touch on communicating potentially bad atoms. Um, and I, I demonstrated that you know, we are able to individually pick atoms either on the ligand or in the protein and give them a particular, a particular comment. And the idea is in frigalysis, uh, these atoms will be represented differently. And also that will, the reason that you give them or give why it's potentially bad uh, is also provided on a, on a hover over. Um, and the, the current representation that we're going for with these really nice spiky balls and these candy cane bonds, um, which I think are garish enough to uh, perhaps draw interest to them at least. Um, but the whole point of this representation is to clearly point out that there is a problem and a crystallographer or the reviewer or the person person's doing the validation uh, should be able to communicate that perhaps there's something wrong and you know, we're highlighting as such because uh, not everyone would be able to interpret the electron density, even though it might seem obvious, uh, they might not understand that, okay, well, you know, someone else has decided they're not confident in this. Um, and we're hoping that, you know, with this sort of mechanism, we can encourage crystallographers who might not release particular crystal models because there are problems with, um, you know, certain atoms uh, that they would then be able to sort of present the information and be quite transparent that they're aware of the problem, um, but it's otherwise fine. And just to quickly go through, if you do want to try any of these software, uh, we have some Docker containers available um, at the Frigalysis Prep, um, and you should be able to run them uh, if you're definitely using Mac or Linux. Um, and then the individual softwares by themselves, if you've managed to, if you want to install them as part of your own stack or uh, run them on your own sort of computers. So that's that. Awesome, thank you, Tyler. That was really good. Um, it's really cool to see how well this has come along actually. So I think last time I did this workshop, we didn't really have a good way of helping people to prepare structures to go into Fragalysis. So it's been excellent to see Tyler develop this platform where we can sort of help users look at their data um, and review it and sort of help to communicate to people what they should be looking at when they're looking at those hits that come out on Fragalysis. And on Fragalysis, these are recent developments as well. So it's really nice. Thanks yeah. very much, Tyler. I, I just want to under, underscore that. I mean, I think one of the things I always find is that people download PDB files and s assume that they're absolutely 100% correct and take it as, uh, and I think that this sort of annotation is actually gonna be really very, very helpful. Yeah, I think it's been a long time coming, hasn't it?
There, there is one Sorry. question, but it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's more philosophical, I guess, but it'd be interesting to get your, your views on it. So is fragment-based drug discovery suitable for the design of linear and cyclic peptides? Darren, take it away. I guess one. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, we have some peptide and peptide-like fragment libraries. Uh, they came out of um, some groups at Newcastle's research. So we, we can screen amino acids and amino acid-like uh, molecules using our techniques. And if you're looking at things like proteases, where we tend to have long peptide substrates, they often have these kind of subsites for each residue with different levels of selectivity and specificity. And you could use fragment screening to identify things which bind in each of these subsites and then link them together using computational methods. So, so uh, would this be a good time then to take the break? Yeah, I think it's a very good time. Okay, Bailey, do you want to? We're, we're very grateful that uh, Liverpool Carachem actually uh, sponsor these things, so they pay for all the licenses and things. So uh, uh, over to you. Yeah, perfect. Uh, thanks to Darren and Tyler for the excellent workshop that we've had so far. Uh, I'm Bailey from Liverpool Carachem, and we're a chemical technology innovator on a mission to accelerate small molecule um, drug discovery. Uh, through expanding access to 3D chemical space. So at Liverpool Chirochem, we are proud to sponsor this series of workshops as we understand how essential that these tools are going to be for the global research community. Um, at LCC, we specialize in using stereo-defined and heterocycles for use in DEL, fragment-based uh, lead design, bifunctional linkers, and our 3 discovery virtual library. If you would like to find out more about how LCC could support your projects, then please reach out to us through our website, liverpoolchirochem.com or find us on LinkedIn. I hope you all enjoy the rest of the workshop and thank you very much. Thanks very much, Bailey. Uh, we'll no break now and uh, be back in, uh, but let's make it uh, at three o'clock. You are. Okay, I am ready to go, I think. All right, can you see my slides okay? Yeah, fine. All right, perfect. So I've just kept the same title as Darren. Uh, so my name's Rachel. I've been working with XChem for about four and a half years now, uh, and I'm now a senior software scientist. So I help with various bits of software um, at XChem, but particularly I work on the Fragalysis project. So I've been leading that for about two years now, I think. Um, so just a quick outline. So I'll give a brief introduction to computer-aided computer drug design and just sort of put it into context where we're working in the drug discovery um, pipeline and process that people generally go through. Uh, I'll show you how to assess structures in fragalysis. So this is leading on from what Tyler's just been talking about, and I'll show you some data that's gone through that process and what it looks like in fragalysis as well. Um, I'll just go through a couple of methods that we're working on at the minute to help with design um, and demonstrate one of those methods in fragalysis as well. Um, and also how you might be able to use fragalysis to help you assess 3D designs of structures as well that you've done computationally. Um, and then I, Tyler's already touched on this, but I'll just quickly go through what the API is designed for as well. Okay, so to start. So this is just a diagram that I stole from online and adapted slightly. And the idea is to just show you sort of what a, a typical drug discovery process might look like. Um, so at the beginning, you have a target that you identify and you might do some bioinformatics on it at that point. So all of the things that are coming off here are all um, computational methods. So it's sort of to put it in perspective of the computational methods. Um, and then you generally have two types of screening at the very beginning of the process. You have either target-based screening or phenotypic screening. Um, and all of the things highlighted in the light blue here are things that you might use something like fragalysis for. Um, so you start at this end and work your way around and it tends to be quite cyclical. So you might go through this 
quite a few times before you actually end up in your lead optimization. So at the point that you're doing screening, here we're talking about virtual screening mostly, there are two main types um, of design that you can use. So the structure-based drug design and ligand-based drug design. So structure-based drug design, we're talking about including information about the protein. So when you've got a structure of the protein or a model that you might have um, from something like homology modeling um, and ligand-based drug design, we're really talking about in some sort of methods, you don't necessarily have a structure at all. You might just have information about the ligands. Um, but you might also use some approaches from ligand-based drug design when you do have structures as well. So in structure-based drug design, you tend to do things like docking, uh, maybe molecular dynamics simulations if you want to get more information about how your ligand's moving around in the protein. Uh, you might do some pharmacophore modeling. So that's the idea of using sort of interactions uh, between the protein and the ligand to fit the ligand in. And you might do some de novo design there as well. Um, and then typical methods in ligand-based drug design, you use things like SAR and QSAR. So this is about uh, predicting properties and looking at them and how they change as you change the design of your ligands. Again, some pharmacophore modeling. Um, and typically you enumerate through new molecules by using things like similarity or shape searching from your initial hits or a molecule you know binds uh, to find something new. Um, so we're mostly focused in this sort of area, we're very early stage, um, but there is more computational work that can be done as you go through lead optimization, right through your clinical trials, all the way to having a drug approved. Um, and quite often things go wrong or you find something new out during your preclinical and clinical trials. And at that point, you sort of go backwards and um, we'll do some more work to see what's going on, what's, what's causing something to go wrong with the target as well. Um, and there's also ADME profiling as well, which is important. So this is um, looking at how the drug interacts in the body essentially and looking at pharmacokinetics, so how it goes through the body. <clears throat> and this is just a little bit of a closer view at the differences between structure-based drug design and fragment-based drug design at the beginning of the process. So Really, the difference is just that when you don't have structural data like we do at XChem, you tend to create models of the target if you can instead. Um, and this is just to show you that that big bit at the end on the other slide is a very, very, very long process. So after you've done all of the apparently easy stuff at the beginning, actually going through and getting a drug into clinical trials is very difficult and takes a very long time. I think it's something insane, like 15 years is the average time it takes to develop a drug. And even then it might not be approved at the end of the clinical trials. Um, and this is just a diagram from our Moonshot work. So if you've not heard of the Moonshot before, it's a big consortium of lots of different institutions all working pro bono to try and develop an antiviral against the SARS main protease, so MPRO. Um, and we're sort of at the point now where we're starting to do lots and lots of lead optimization and putting things in animals. Um, and so this is sort of the beginning phase that I was talking about earlier. Uh, so for us, it's a bit different. We have crowdsourced designs in this project, which means basically we opened up the problem to the whole world, started a website and asked people to submit their designs for compounds. And that resulted in about 10,000 compounds being submitted by people from around 350 different people. Um, and then from those designs, which came from information from an initial screen we did, we can then go on to do some computational analysis. So we do large scale docking and some um, free energy perturbation using folding at home. And there's also some machine learning driven prioritization involved so to decide what to synthesize um, in the lab and bring back in to screening. So once that synthesis prioritization has been done, they go off to CROs. So these are companies that basically make the molecules for us and give them back to us to go back into our platform. And then there's a lot of assays involved 
of course the x-ray crystallography do that we do at XChem and some NMR as well and this just goes around in lots and lots of cycles. Okay so moving on a little bit to what to specifically designing molecules computationally this is just a quick slide to show what the typical uh, process is when you're designing one particular molecule from a set of fragment hits. So the first thing you need to do is triage. So that's basically looking at all the data you've got from a fragment screen, for example, um, or if you're not using a fragment screen, it might be structures that you've pulled from the PDB that have ligands in for a particular target. Uh, and you need to prioritize which ones you actually want to develop further. But you've got to remember that these have poor binding affinity. So you're not going to have information like uh, bind and assay information to tell you very specifically which ones are best to go after. So when you're filtering at this point, what you've got to lead you is either structural or ligand based uh, information. And from that, you need to generate your own hypotheses for how you can use that information to generate follow ups which will bind better than those initial hits. So after you've generated those hypotheses, you generally need to find some way of designing molecules or more commonly enumerating a library to find new molecules. Uh, so that enumeration has to be aligned with the hypotheses that you've generated at the beginning. And the idea is to tell you how you should modify the initial hits that you've prioritized. And then finally, from this enumeration, you'll have a big long list of molecules that you could make or buy. Um, and you need to score them so you can evaluate how well they fit your hypotheses. Um, so for that initial triaging stage, the stuff that Darren and Tyler have been covering is obviously quite important in fragment-based drug discovery. So I'm just going to show you quickly on Fragalysis um, some examples of what that looks like. So I will now go to Fragalysis. So when you get to Fragalysis, you get a landing page and the list on the left over here is a list of all of the open source targets that we've released data for. I am going to show Empro today because everyone loves the main protease and the COVID work. So I'll just click on that and let it load up and make the window a bit bigger. Okay. So on the top left um, here is the HIC cluster selector. So currently this shows the reference protein here with a bunch of spheres. And these spheres are proportional in size to the number of molecules that are in that site. Uh, and those sites were labeled by Darren on XChem Review. Um, so I'm going to select site five, which I know has some of those quality annotations. So when you select a site, or you can select multiple if you like, you get a big long list of all of the ligands that are found in that site. And then if you see a ligand with this yellow warning triangle on it, that means that the crystallographer or reviewer has flagged something up as wrong with that molecule. So we can turn the ligand on, we can center on it by clicking on the target um, and just bring it into view. And at the minute it's just, oh, by default, in fact, uh, it shows the quality annotation. So at the minute you can see the spiky balls and the candy cane bonds that Tyler was talking about earlier um, and with those comments. So in this case, it's been commented on as having weak density. And if we click on the D button, in this uh, strip of buttons here, we can actually turn on the electron density. Uh, in my opinion, the most useful one is the event map for our data. So that's the maps generated by Panda, which Darren explained in the first part of the talk. So if we turn them on, it'll um, show up and you can see there's maybe a little bit of density missing around here. Um, if you wanna change any of the settings to view these a little bit differently, um you can click on the settings control box and then you can sort of play around with the levels that the maps are displaying in um and change their opacity and that kind of thing as well uh, and if you prefer maps to be shown as solid surfaces 
you can also load it up that way as well by just clicking on the D button again. And the idea is you can go through and use these annotations to help you decide um, on specific ligands whether you should make adaptations to them at those points or not. So if you don't believe the electron density, um, then don't elaborate on those points is what I'd say. So other ways of looking at these ligands and help to triage them a bit, we can do things like turn on proteins and interactions. Um, and that would be a surface. And if we center on that one, it has disappeared. Oh, I don't have the ligand on, that's why. There we go. So now you can look at the interactions that the ligand is forming in 3D. Um, and you can also turn on multiple ligands at once as well. So if you have multiple ligands in the same site, you can turn on them and start to see maybe what kinds of opportunities you could have to modify one ligand with parts of the other. Um, and you could also turn on multiple interaction maps and sort of look at where different ligands are making different interactions as well. Okay, so I will go back to my slides now. Cool. Okay, so just a little bit on how to design a follow-up. So this is just covering a couple of methods that we are using or developing at XChem and as part of the COVID moonshot as well. And um, so I've just stolen Darren's diagram just to remind you of what the, the three typical ways of doing this are. So there's fragment growing, which is where you're, you have an initial hit and then you add something to it uh, to grow it further out into the site, usually. Uh, there's fragment linking. So this is when you have two fragments that are found um, and you find a way to join them together. And then there's fragment merging, which is where you have a clear overlap between two different molecules. Oh, I don't know how that happened. Um, and you just merge them together, essentially. Okay, <clears throat> so I'll start with fragment growing and talk about the fragment network. Um, so the fragment network is based on some work that Aztex did a while ago now in 2017. Um, and essentially it's a way of encoding relationships between molecules and parts of molecules. So it's a graph database. So you have nodes that are joined by edges and on the nodes you have the parts of the molecules and along the edges, you can assign properties, labels, and directionality um, to tell you how to get from one molecule or fragment to another molecule or fragment. Um, within the fragment network, the compounds consist of rings, linkers, and substituents. Uh, so there's an example here where it's labeled, you have a, a ring here, a substituent might be this OH group, and the linker might be the bond between the two uh, carbons on the rings. Um, and to generate the network, you basically remove these groups down. So that's also demonstrated here where you just split it up by iterating through. So you might go from these two rings to the phenol over here, and then you might break it down further so that you've got just an alcohol group on its own. Um, and essentially you can go through that network through these groups and eventually build up molecules. So the idea is that you can probe chemical space around a compound you're interested in um, and search modifications you can make to that as well. So now I'll demonstrate how that's visually uh, represented in Fragalysis and how you can navigate that fragment network to find follow-ups. So I'll just go back to Fragalysis. Um, I'll turn off everything that's there already. And I will turn on a different site. And we'll find a molecule that has some vectors. There we go. So I'll turn on this ligand. We're already centered on it. So when you click on the V button, that V stands for vectors. And vectors in Fragalysis mean um, places you can elaborate. So if you've got an arrow, that's a direction you can elaborate in. And if you've got a cylinder across a molecule, um, that's a linker that you can replace or change, or you can change the things at either end of that linker. 
Uh, when you see a, a green shape, that means there are a lot of molecules available on that vector. When you see a yellow shape, that means there are uh, up to 10 molecules available on that vector. And when you see a red shape, that means that the network knows that that is an, a direction that you could elaborate in, but we don't have anything in the network catalogued uh, available on that vector. So if we click on one of these vectors, what you're presented with is essentially a list of compounds that we can make. Um, and if you look very closely at the diagram up here, you can see highlighted there the bond between uh, the ring carbon and the fluorine up here. So that's just showing you which vector you're elaborating on. Uh, so then these are just 2D images of what you can buy. And then the text underneath gives you a vendor and a catalog code. So real means enamine real database. And then the number is the catalog code for it or the compound code that they use uh, just so that you know you can buy them from a particular place. And then Molport, of course, is Molport and the the number next to it, you can search Molport to find that compound. Um, and that's essentially it for the fragment network. Uh, if you select these, if it was something you're interested in, it'll end up in this list called selected compounds. Uh, so you can sort of compile a list of things you're interested in and eventually download a CSV. And that will contain uh, all of the information about the vendors as well. So you can then split that up by vendors and go straight to them and order those compounds from them if you wish. Okay. So now just a bit more information about different algorithms that we've been working under over the last couple of years. So during the COVID moonshot, uh, there were a couple of different lead series that came from uh, merging strategies, but these were essentially things that people had seen in fragalysis and said, oh, there's an overlap there between those two fragments. I'm going to draw a new molecule uh, that incorporates all of those things. Um, and we took that as an opportunity to maybe develop a more automated approach to finding mergers uh, through these overlap combinations. Uh, so a guy called Matteo Ferla in Oxford uh, helped us at that point. So he dropped everything he was doing and started working on an algorithm called Fragmentstein. So essentially what Fragmentstein does is exactly the same thing that you would do if you were visually looking at those fragments. It looks for the best combination of the molecules by uh, directly overlapping them, taking the atom positions of the overlapping region and designing something new. So, it, so for example, here there's a follow-up compound um, and here you can see two overlapping molecules here and we want to design a new one. Uh, we have a bunch of molecules to overlap with. This is what's come out as the best overlap um, and basically it's called Fragmentstein because it stitches the molecules together like some sort of Frankenstein's monster. Um, once you've stitched together the different parts of the molecules, it essentially does a minimization in the protein structure and it does that using Pi Rosetta. Um, this isn't implemented directly in Fragalysis yet, but it has been used on a couple of projects. And if you want to use that, you can go over to GitHub and uh, follow the instructions there to get it working. Uh, it's all open source as well. The only thing that might be difficult for some people if you're not an academic is Pi Rosetta. Uh, if you are an academic, Pi Rosetta is fine. You just have to get a username and password from their website, I believe. Uh, we do hope in the future to be able to implement workflows in the back end of Fragalysis so that you could run this directly when you do an upload and then those results will be available. Um, the problem with using something like Fragmentstein is it because it's just using overlaps and it doesn't have any chemical knowledge and um, it might give you some things that are just not really molecules they're not synthetically feasible or even chemically sensible um, so another bit of work that's been done is expanding on some of the fragmentstein work but also including um, the fragment network so this is some work done by a rotation student we had 
a few months ago called Steph Willis, and she's now a DPhil student at Oxford. She's coming back to Exchem to do her PhD, which is great. Um, so she was essentially working out whether you could find opportunities for fragment mergers using what already exists in the fragment network. So she came up with this sort of schema. So the idea is you have two fragments um, and you want to combine the bits together to merge them. So what she did is she essentially took a fragment. So the example here, she's taken fragment B and splits it up into synthons. So that's similar to what you do when you're generating the fragment network, when you break the molecule up into pieces. Uh, and here where the xenon atoms are, this is a place where you could attach something essentially. Um, and then, so in this example, she selected this synthon where the attachment point is here and she's attached it to fragment A. And this is the merge you get out of it. And then essentially what you can do is you can look, you can use whatever method you want to generate a 3D structure. So probably something like docking. Um, and then she's got examples here where the two molecules that have gone in are shown in cyan and the pink, and then the green molecule is the merge that's come straight out of the fragment network, which is really nice. So hopefully we'll be able to adapt the back end of Fragalysis quite soon so that we can include this sort of enumeration as well as the vector-based enumeration for growing. Uh, and then for fragment linking as well, which is sort of the, the final type of uh, design strategy, a guy called Ruben, who works over in Oxford, uh, in Charlotte Dean's group, but also very closely with us in Xchem, has been working on linking Fragmentstein together with an algorithm uh, designed in Charlotte's group by Fergus Imry called D-Linker. Uh, D-Link is essentially a deep generative model that finds uh, linkers and it was trained with structural information. So it included information both from the protein and the ligand. And it essentially suggests ways that you can link two molecules together over a certain distance. Um, and if you wanna use D-Linker, that's also available on GitHub and the papers here. Okay, and this is just a couple of examples from the moonshot of uh, where molecules have gone through lead series. I won't go into them in too much detail, um, but this first series on the left is the one I'm talking about that was initially development developed from looking at the overlay of two different molecules in fragalysis, which is really nice. Okay, so how to assess a design. So if you've used one of those methods or any other method to uh, predict some 3D structures of what your ligands might look like, how would you then go on to assess it um, in fragalysis? I'll just take a step back um, and mention that for the fragment network compounds, we have a ligand-based method for predicting a structure um, available in Fragalysis. And I'll demonstrate it to you in a minute. But essentially what that method does is it takes the 2D structure of the ligand that you've selected from the list of compounds on the vector, uh, and it takes the coordinates of the reference molecule that that vector came from. Um, it generates 100 confirmations of the new molecule, and then aligns it to the reference molecule from the structure. Um, and it essentially selects the best one based on shape and color. So that means the shape of the reference molecule versus the confirmation of the new molecule. Um, and color's talking about a sort of pharmacophoric overlay, so the functionality. Uh, so there's an example here, and I'll show you how to do that in Fragalysis quickly. So if we go back to Fragalysis and go back to our vector selector, if you hold shift and then just click on one of them, it'll go pale. And if you give it a second, there you go, it'll pop up a um, ligand-based generation of what that molecule might look like. Uh, it does it on the fly as well. And the com confirmer generation can be quite random. So if you think there's something wrong with it and you try it again, it'll, it might give you a slightly different confirmation, particularly if it's a very flexible molecule. The smaller, more rigid ones tend to usually be the same. And I've unselected the vector. Anyway. 
Okay. Uh, and the next part of the demonstration is also in Fragalysis. So in Fragalysis, you do have the ability to upload um, designs as well as the initial data, which I'll show later. So if you go to Fragalysis um, <clears throat> forward slash viewer forward slash upload CSET, you essentially end up at a very, very simple page, uh, which is to upload what we call a, a compound set, but it's essentially a set of molecules that you've designed in 3D. Um, so you just select a target and then you upload uh, an SDF file of the molecules you're interested in. Um, and these are specified, I believe, in the API do documentation and also on the Posterior forum. I can find it later, but essentially what you do is you create an SDF file of all your molecules and you have one molecule at the beginning of the file, which is called a, a blank molecule. And you include some information there about um, any scores you're including, what they mean, uh, a link to um, the method you used to generate the molecules, um, and also a, a bit of metadata about who generated the information and the institution that they're at as well. It'll be a bit clearer when I show you in a minute. Uh, you can also upload associated PDB files. There's a, a property key defined in that SDF spec that allows you to link to a specific file that you upload if you want to provide your own PDB files. Otherwise, you can link uh, directly to PDBs that already exist in Fragalysis. Uh, and then you can either choose to validate your upload or you can upload it directly. Uh, the validation is also done when you do that upload. And if you're doing an update, you can select the set that you're updating as well from this list. And then you just click submit and that goes ahead and does all of the processing and brings the data back into Fragalysis for you. So I will just show you an example of one of these in Fragalysis. Um, okay, so there's an example here of some of the folding at home work that was done. So this is, this is the work I was talking about earlier for the moonshot. Um, and if we turn one of those ligands on, In fact, I might just quickly refresh because I don't know where the currently turned on molecule is. I'll quickly refresh and then just start from there. Okay. Okay, so if we turn the ligand on, this is a, a, a predicted 3D structure uh, from an FEP simulation and it's shown in the wireframe there. So that's the L button. The P button shows the protein. So that's either the protein that the, the upload is added or it's a, a protein from one of these structures that they've specified. And then as on the left-hand side with the actual X-ray data, we can also turn on interactions. So you can start to look at the interactions that are predicted to happen for your new molecule. Um, and the great thing we can do is we can specify molecules from the initial fragment screen that inspired the new design when we do the upload. So if you click on the F button over here, you get a list of the what we call inspiration molecules and you can turn them on. Um, and that's essentially turned on from the left hand side. Uh, but we just display it in this box as well because sometimes it can be quite hard to navigate both the left and the right hand side at the same time. And the idea there is you can do a direct comparison between the initial hit and the new, the new predicted confirmation of the molecule as well. And you can see what the differences are. So you can see here along with this CC bond, we've essentially changed it for a, a ring over here instead. Um, yeah, and you can turn on all the usual stuff from both sides. So if you wanted to, you could turn on interactions and predict what's changing. Uh, and you can also have multiple ligands from either side on at the same time. The values across the bottom here on the right hand side are scores that the users input. So this one, for example, the text is quite small. Um, but this value is a delta delta G in kilocalories per mole. And you can see the description of the score that the upload is given as well. Uh, so 
in this case it's the relative computed free energy difference um and then another score as well and if you want to filter these scores if you understand what they're for and you know what what a good value is or um what you're looking for you can filter down using this filter and search modal which is just this button here and um, so if we were looking at the delta delta g we want to think more negative so we can look at the most negative molecules and then we can also make that the priority and uh we're already sorting them so that they're going from the best to the worst but we could flip that order as well and um, depending on what we're looking for and that should just help you to triage a bit particularly if you've got a list of hundreds of molecules uh, and you want to filter them down a little bit for your visual inspection. Um, you can also clear the filters as well if you want to, and that'll just bring your list back to the full set. Uh, when you're looking through this molecule, these molecule designs, another thing you can do is select them. So if you say, I really like this molecule, I wanna buy it or I wanna make it, you can select it and you can add multiple multiple selections as well and they will end up uh along with the vector selections in a list so we could also turn some uh we don't have any vectors there if i had to select a selection from the vector selector as well they would also appear in this list and then you can download the whole selection um and that cv csv file will still include all of the vendor information about the compounds from the vector network but it will also include any scoring from the uploaded molecules as well but it's just a really nice way to keep track of all of your data in one place i think okay and then just to finish off um make sure i've not missed any slides no we're good uh, just a quick bit of info about the API. Uh, so what the API is intended to do is help you prepare data for upload, which I'll very quickly show at the end how you can upload your data to Fragalysis if you want to share open source data. Um, download specific data. So there's functionality, for example, to download a very specific set of PDBs. Uh, in Fragalysis, you can download all of the structures for a target with a button on the top menu bar that says download. Um, and you can also do a very basic of query of the graph network. So if you have your own molecule at home, that's not from Fragalysis and you have the smiles for it, you can essentially input that smiles um, through the API and get a list of molecules back from the graph network to look at further. We also a while ago wrote some practical exercises for a workshop we did with Oxford um, that nicely demonstrates using the API in conjunction with the MPRO data. So if it's something you want to look at more, um, you can go here and play around with that. If you have any problems with it, you can just put an issue on GitHub and we'll get straight back to you. And of course, the, the API is at the link that Tyler mentioned earlier. Um, before I show any more stuff in Fragalysis, I'd like to just do some acknowledgements. Um, it's a big slide. So, Anthony Bradley came up with the original idea for Fragalysis. He's now at Accentia, still doing some fantastic work in the same area. Um, Rick used to do our front end, and he was with us until a couple of years ago. Um, Informatics Matters, so uh, Tim, Alan, and Duncan, who's not on this slide, they do all of our back end work, uh, and M2M Solutions do our front end work. The Fragment 5 are a group of students from Oxford, uh, DPhil students who did a software project in their first year. They developed the first version of the Fragalysis API. So really none of the data in its current form would be in there without the work that they did um, now. And then of course, there's a lot of different groups involved. So Frank's Oxford group who generate all of the data uh, and the Diamond guys who get all of the data. Um, Anna, my PhD student, has done a lot of work with data to massage it out. Um, some of the other guys at the SGC have been involved. And then there's all of our users and collaborators as well who really drive forward the work 
we do and the way we do it. Uh, and just to say thanks, there's a picture of my cute dog. Apologies if you don't like dogs. Um, and I did say I'd quickly cover how you can upload your own structures. So to do that, you need to be logged into Fragalysis. So if you click on the menu bar, you can click on login. Um, and if you're a diamond user, click on the diamond cast button. Otherwise you can log in with your ORCID ID. Um, and that will just take you through to ORCID and uh, redirect you that way. I don't know if mine works on Chrome. I don't think so. So I'll just log in with my diamond ID. And then the file that you download from XChem Review, if you use that locally, is what goes into the upload page. Um, so that's viewer upload T set instead of T C set. And I'm not logged in. It didn't work. How wonderful. If you just give me a second, I should be able to log in. If not, then it's a, that did not work. It's a very similar page to the CSET page, but you just upload the zip file of the targets from XCAM review instead. Okay, it's not letting me log in, so I, I can't show you. It's very typical of live demos to do this. Um, but yes, you would just upload the zip file and it would do the same thing. You can either validate or upload. And that is all. I have finished slightly earlier, but I'm sure no one will mind. Um, That's really good. Do you have any questions, Chris? Well, I, I have a question. Um, yeah. Can can users add things to the graph database? No, not to our version. Um, so it's quite a, a computationally intense process to add stuff to the graph database at the minute. Um, doing that fragmentation and then going through what's already there to add the parts and find all of the links between them. Uh, so we tend to update that. I think now we're doing it about once a year. Before it was such an intense task that before we did some work to improve the fragment network, we only did it once <laughs> yeah. and then we never did it again, but we've recently updated it. Uh, the code to make the fragment network yourself is available. So you could create your own version of the fragment network and then populate it with whatever you want. Yeah. I think uh, that might be if people have their own proprietary databases, of compounds and things like this might be something that they'd be interested in doing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And uh, you keep mentioning open source and things like this, but how easy is it for somebody to set this up themselves if they wanted to? So there is a local version of Fragalysis that essentially we use for development. So if you go to GitHub slash XChem slash Fragalysis hyphen front end, there are some instructions there as to how you can set up your own Docker container with Fragalysis in it. Uh, and we recommend that as a starting point um, if you've got data that you want to use that you don't want to put on Fragalysis itself. Yeah. I think it takes a bit of skill, but if you're familiar with Docker, then you should be okay. Right. Yeah. I don't know if anybody has any questions, but if you could just put them into the Q&A box, then we'll try and uh, do them. So how many people do you have using Fragalysis other than the government shop? It's hard to know. So it gets used um, with our collaborators. So if we have collaborators that are doing open source uh, work, then we will suggest that they upload it to Fragalysis before we'll help them with design. Maybe Darren knows a bit more. He seems to have turned his camera on. Yeah, I was just going to say we did a, a large screen on the, the SARS-CoV-2 macro domain. 
in collaboration with some people at Oxford and at UCSF over in California. And what we did for that is we actually made all the links for each individual fragment structure um, from Fregalysis available in the supplementary information on the paper as well. So rather than just giving them 2D pictures and saying this is what we observed in the, the crystal structure, people could just click a link and instantly go to that view and have a look for themselves. So we have tried to make some things more publicly available and share, which would be possible without Fregalysis. Yeah. And, and those links will be permanent? I hope so. <laughs> There's two types of links in Fragalysis. So there's something called a direct link. Um, and you see examples of it in the moonshot work as well, where you're basically turning on a specific molecule with specific controls. So that's a link that should always work, providing the structure exists with that label. Um, and then the other kind of link you can share is a project or a snapshot link. So that's where someone has turned on a bunch of stuff and wants to share the page exactly how it is. Um, none of them should break, but the direct links are definitely less fragile than the snapshots. I think you've uh, overwhelmed everybody. <laughs> no questions. Yeah, I mean, I think this is absolutely a fa fabulous resource. Um, I know of several universities are using it as a teaching resource. I think it's perfect for that, but it's also perfect for people involved in, you know, proper drug discovery programs as well. And I think uh, yeah, you, you've done a fantastic job in that respect. Where do you see this going from now? It's it's hard to imagine, isn't it? Um, so there's. A lot of work that's being done at the minute. So there's a, a couple of things upcoming with the moonshot um, and a couple of features already in development um, that are quite exciting. So instead of the sites that we've got up on the left hand side, uh, we're developing the concept of tags. So the idea is you'd be able to tag not only a site, so like an active site or an allosteric site, but also maybe like a chemical series that you're working on. So you could have this molecule is in the active site and it's part of the isoquinoline series that we're developing. And you could navigate through both of those concepts at the same time or individually if you wanted to. Um, we think that's quite exciting. Uh, we've got discussion threads are already in there. So we've implemented um, a discourse forum essentially on the back end. And if you're logged into Fragalysis, you can see little speech bubbles next to all of the targets and on the top of the page as well. And we hope that will help people to collaborate on the on the projects a bit more and keep a record of things like those project snapshots and allow to, people to comment on things like designs. So that's really exciting. Um, and then, of course, there's all of the, the algorithms that we're working on as well. And the algorithms are interesting in themselves. But what is even more interesting is how the tool will develop to help people navigate that massive amount of data that comes out of doing something like a virtual screen or follow-up design because i think you know having scores and rankings and things like that is all well and good but there needs to be something to show you what to look for um, and to help you navigate it a bit better in 3d as well one of the things that strikes me about fragalysis is it's very much a single target um, focus and one of the things that comes up in drug discovery regularly is selectivity and things like this. Any plans to sort of provide tools that enable you to look at multiple proteins at the same time and, and point out where you might explore for selectivity? I don't think we've thought too much in terms of the, the structural information um, between a couple of targets. All we've really thought about is bringing in information uh, from external re external resources, so stuff like um, activity information, for example. And maybe as part of that, you could also run a query that looks at an external data source and gives you some information about where else you might find those molecules bound. Yeah. Um, but it's all still very much in the works. I think we've got a question there yeah. in the chat. Could you Could explain, I explain 
a bit more about the front end. Uh, yeah, so I don't, I'm not sure exactly what they mean. Um, maybe uh, it's because I mentioned the front end data, the front end code base. What do you think, Chris? I think just pointing out when, the initial view uh, that you get when you log into Fregalysis and you select MPro, yeah, what all the different uh, fields contain, because it, it yeah. is a little bit imposing the There's first a lot time there, you see. <laughs> yeah. Um, so one thing I will refer them in to is the uh, YouTube video of the last workshop that we did. Mm -hmm. So I think there should be a link to that somewhere um, on the internet. If you just search for Fragalysis workshop. Um, otherwise, I can do a very, very quick run through now. Uh, how long have we got? We've got 10 minutes. Let's see what we can get done. Okay. Um, so what all of the stuff is when you first get there. Um, so if I was logged in, which it wouldn't let me do because it's a live demo, um, and that's typical, here I'd have a list of projects which I've referred to a couple of times. So that's essentially a collection of snapshots of Fragalysis. Um, and on the left-hand side is the target list. So these are all the names that we give to the targets in XChem, essentially. And some of them have a bit of supplementary information that you can click and open another page on which I won't show you, but if you click on them, you'll see what I mean. It's just a bit more information about the experiment that was done. Um, and then different bits on the page, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So I've mentioned the site selector. There's a clear selection button that essentially kills all of the sites. Um, in the hit navigator, there's this drop down that allows you to apply a couple of default filters. So you can apply a rule of Lipinski's rule of five or a rule of three, if you want to. Um, if, for example, you've read a manuscript and you've been directed to Fragalysis and you're looking for a particular structure, you can search for it here. Uh, so I could do P0906, for example, um, and it'll just highlight any entry that matches that there. Um, similarly to the right hand side where we've got filters for calculated properties. We've also got along here uh, molecular descriptors. So just things like log P and molecular weight. And you can also filter and sort based on those. So you can change the priority of the sorting with these buttons and you can change the order of sorting that value to ascending or descending with the radio buttons. And then these are just the, the different um, descriptors and slider values so you can restrict it to between two different values and you can clear all of them with the clear filter button. Um, there's an indication of how many molecules you've currently got loaded here. Uh, the display buttons at the bottom do various different things. So we have the, the concept of actions in Fragalysis. So if you do a bunch of things in Fragalysis, for example, turn on loads of ligands, and you click on the timeline button, then you get a list of all of those actions you've done. So it essentially tells you when sites are turned on and off, when you've turned on ligands, all of that kind of thing, um, right from the beginning where you initially load up the target. And if you really want to, you can add magical icons to them and they change in, in the circle uh, or change what that says if you want to record it as something else, just to give yourself a, a mental note of what you were doing at that time. Um, so those actions you can undo as well. So this, the innermost set of arrows will undo an action. Um, and when you're moving the NGL viewer, the outermost set of arrows will undo the NGL action that you've just done. So if you get a bit lost in your view, you can navigate between um, those actions as well. Uh, the settings are for things like changing the clipping and fogging settings. And the display controls are for doing very specific things like adding new representations of things um, to your screen. So things that aren't available by default from these buttons over here, which I'll cover quickly now. And you can just add and hide things there. 
I put a link to the Fragalysis workshop you did in the chat. Awesome. That's that's a good place to go for most of this stuff, I think. Um, this set of buttons, I guess, is the most important bit for the initial hit. So new things are the center on button. So that's just if you get a bit lost, you click on it and it centers on that particular ligand. Um, L is for the ligand, P is for the protein, C is for contacts, S is a surface. Um, the D button is the electron density that I demonstrated earlier. Q button is the quality representation and V is the vectors. Um, and then I think we've covered most stuff on the right hand side. Other buttons up here that I've not shown yet. This is the download button. So this essentially gives you a zip file of both the original information. Um, so the crystallographic information and the data as it's uploaded to Fragalysis as well. Um, the share button will create a static snapshot of the page as it is at the minute. And the save button will start a project, which is essentially a collection of snapshots. And that's probably the quickest run through I've ever done of all of the controls on Fragalysis. There is a question. Can we add targets from the PDB website to the target list? Yes. Um, so at the minute, we tend to just include uh, from the PDB structures that we're interested in. So when we do an upload, we also curate any structures from the PDB and we just run them through the Fragalysis API and that puts them in the right uh, format to upload. Um, I guess it would be a great feature if you could uh, see any target from the PDB in the context of Fragalysis. I believe PDB Europe have got a, a similar view now though. So particularly for coronavirus, they have target pages and you can click on a, a button. I think it says ligand view and it'll view, it bring up a, a similar viewer where you've got a, a reference structure and then all of the ligands around that reference structure to navigate. Uh, James, thank you very much. And as, as a sort of technical question, what, what are you using to display the structures? Uh, NGL viewer. Okay. A minute. Okay, well, I think we finished all the questions. Uh, just remains for me to uh, thank uh, um, Darren, Tyler and uh, Rachel for a, another uh, fantastic uh, workshop. I think this is one of the thing, one, one of the better ones we've had actually. I really enjoyed uh, basically explaining what the pitfalls are with PDB files. I think it's absolutely invaluable and I can see this being one of the most popular uh, videos that we uh, have. I think uh, it's also the fact that it's all web-based means that people don't have to install software and things like this. They can just try it anywhere they are. Um, you, you're using Chrome, but do other web browsers work? We recommend Chrome or Firefox for Fragalysis specifically. Yeah. I think for um, XChem Review, pretty much any browser works, although Tyler will correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, uh, all the, uh, any, any browser works for XChem Review. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you very much. It's been, as I say, a brilliant workshop. I think we've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it and we've uh, had a number of, uh, oh, you're starting to get thank you comments in the chat. I think people have really appreciated it. Thanks for uh, your time and uh, uh, I'll, I'll let you go now and uh, have a uh, refreshing drink of some kind. I wonder if it'll be alcoholic. Thanks very much for having us, Chris. It's and been uh, really thank you to Darren and Tyler as well yeah. for, for helping me out this time. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, everybody. Everybody keep safe. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, guys.